uh, head back towards 1 Peter, where we've been going through 1 Peter on and off throughout uh, the last couple of weeks, and and we've talked of Shavuot, we've talked of the coming of the Ruach HaKodesh, and, and um, really Peter talks about a lot of remembering God in the times of persecution. We know that Peter, as an apostle, as a sent out one, became known as the apostle to the to the Jews, and when he writes this letter, he He's primarily speaking to Jewish followers of Jesus. He, he also knows that there's many Gentiles that are grafted in to these communities throughout Asia Minor. But, um, but his message is primarily to those in the diaspora. And a couple of weeks ago, when we were last talking through Peter, we talked on that wonderful subject of submission. We, we touched on submission to governmental authorities. And what that's supposed to look like. We talked about submission to uh, masters or bosses. And, and how we can reflect God's character in those sorts of relationships as well. Uh, we, we also want to remember that just because we are submitting to authorities. Does not mean that we are doormats. It doesn't mean that we lay aside our godly principles or, or our following of the Lord. However... Because we see even in the life of Peter, we know that in chapter in Acts chapter 3 and 4, Peter and John go before the Sanhedrin. And they specifically tell the, the leaders, the rulers of that time, well, we have to make a choice here whether to follow you or to follow God. We have to follow God. And I, that, is, that is something that is very, very pertinent today. In many different nations, we are blessed to be in a nation that most of the things that the government commands us to do are in line with Scripture. There, there's honestly not that much that our government asks us to do that is not in line with Scripture. There are some things, and we 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 push on on that politically, but but we have to acknowledge the authorities that God has set in place. Today we're going to continue this theme of submission and really talk about submission within the home. Uh, submission and how that leads to shalom bait or peace in the home. I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. Likewise, wives, be submitted to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the message, by the wives' conduct, without a word, they might be won over, as they observe your pure, reverent conduct. Don't let your beauty be external, braiding of the hair and wearing jewelry or fine clothes. Instead, let it be in the hidden person of the heart, with the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is the way that the holy women, who put their hope, in God, used to beautify themselves long ago, being submitted to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her daughters by doing what is good and not fearing intimidation. In the same way, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Though they are weaker partners, honor them as equal heirs. Of the grace of life. In this way, your prayers will not be hindered. We know that Peter was married. Uh, we know it's, uh, I was just reading it again this morning in, in Mark chapter 1. We see that Peter and his Andrew brother went to their mother, to their home and Peter's mother-in-law was sick. Well, uh, there's only one way of getting a mother-in-law and that's to have a wife. And so, uh, but it's a, it's a blessing. It was a blessing. And then the, Yeshua came in and, and healed Peter's mother-in-law. We also see from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, that Peter's wife actually went with him on many of his journeys, uh, missionary journeys that he took uh, throughout the region. So we see that he was accompanied by his, his wife. Verse 1 is interesting. Oh, well, before I get to verse 1, there's actually a couple of other different... Um, uh, things we can learn from some of the first century historians, uh, first and second century. 
For instance, Clement of Alexandria, we actually learn that Peter and his wife had children. So we know that they, they had a family. And then we see from Eusebius, uh, one of the early church historians, he states that Peter was actually present when his wife was martyred. He was actually there when she was martyred. And that's written in Eusebius. And we'll, we'll have a lot of the references. I actually started looking at some of these references uh, as well. So they, they lived this life together. They, they walked to the end together. And we learn from the same historians, of course, that Peter himself was martyred by being crucified upside down. But this is, here's Peter writing this, and he's talking of this relation uh, with regards to peace in the home. And he starts out by saying, likewise. It's the same as saying, therefore. And like I've said before, whenever you see a therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. You need to go and realize that in the same way that we respect the authorities that God has put in place, in the same way that we, we give honor to our bosses as an employee, to the employer, so also we need to honor one another within the home. We submit to human authorities, just as servants submit to masters, and as to, but we do it as unto the Lord. We're doing it as a reflection of our submission to the Lord. Wives are called to submit to their, to their husbands. And I, I did talk about this with my wife before, and I have her permission to, to, to speak on this um, and, and, and to go on through this. Here and in other passages in, in Paul's writings, we, we see the, really the recipe for having peace within the home. Shalom bait, peace within the home. God wants shalom in the home. I love the term shalom. Shalom is not just a peace because there's no trouble. Shalom talks of completeness. It talks of wholeness and fulfillment. That sort of peace, a, a, a peace that brings fulfillment in the home. And our marriage as believers is supposed to be a reflection of, of, a, of that peace that God gives, of the nurturing, respect, and chesed. Chesed is, is loving kindness. It's, it's really covenantal love. Loving kindness, covenantal love. I mean, how much more can we demonstrate that but in the covenant of marriage? And maintaining our home with shalom ba'i, it's, it's a very important ideal in Judaism as well. We see that the marriage between a man and his wife is, is supposed to be this connection between God and the people. Constantly we see throughout the prophets, they're constantly talking, you know, of Israel as a wife. You are my wife who was betrothed to me in my youth, or in your youth, not in God's youth, understood, but... But he's using that language of covenantal love. And our marriages as believers is supposed to reflect that. I know that, uh, you know, we've all read the fairy tales. We've all seen the novels. And, the, and <clears throat> there's obviously a great many novels that are written on marriage. And, and we see the, the movies that are put out by Hollywood. And, and at the end of all the movies, we see people riding off into the sunset, living, quote, happily ever after. This concept of happily ever after. You know, here are two people, it was just this ideal romance and they were meant for each other and their love was just going to keep them happily ever after. And, you know, this, this kind of leaves us with this idea that there's not going to be any troubles, there's not going to be any rocks in the road, it's just going to be perfect from then on. That the love that they had at the beginning was just so right and so good that it was going to maintain them throughout the rest of their lives. And, and we, we instinctively know that reality is not like the movies. But somewhere along the way, we, 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 see to, we seem to try and say, well, maybe I'll be different from the rest of the world. Maybe our life will be just happily ever after. Maybe it'll be the exception from the rule. 
However, family harmony is not that easy. It's something that, we act, that actually requires a huge amount of work. And actually anything of value actually requires a huge amount of work. If you think of all the things that are of, of true value, they usually take a lifetime of work to develop. So now we're going to talk about the wife's role. Peter here, as well as the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, he speaks of a divine order. He talks of an order of relationships and he bases it upon the creation order. So when he's looking of the order, he just looks back to creation. But it is very important not to confuse order with importance or value. Elsewhere, Rabbi Shaul, he refers to uh, the creation order as the husband uh, given the authority to which the wife must submit. Now, this is also true of children to their parents and slaves to their masters. Or if you like, in our term terminology, employees submitting to their employers. However, Peter in no way suggests that wives are inferior, nor that the women must submit to all men. Specifically, Peter teaches that a wife must submit to her own husband. Just because man was created before woman does not mean that man has more importance or more value than a woman. And we should not get this confused. We don't confuse the, the person on one hand and the role on the other. The value of the individual on one hand and the job and the role and the function that they perform on another. Husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves, all have equal dignity and value because just like was spoken to Noah just after the flood, all people are created in the image of God. Male and female he created them, is how Yeshua put it. All have been given equal value. Equal value in the eyes of God. <clears throat> I know the very notion of submission is really not popular today. It's not popular at all. Nobody wants to submit to authority. I will, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about the news from the last week, but I mean, what we're seeing is people not wanting to submit to authority. Oh, we, we say there's reasons. Well, there's reasons why I don't want to submit to authority. I have my rights. I have my reasons why I'm not going to submit to authority. It's not popular. It's not fashionable. It flies in the face of contemporary attitudes of permissiveness and, and freedom. Our age is an age of liberation. We are not, we're not slaves. We're liberated. We have rights. And you know what? There is a place that we need to resist oppression When we see it, that's true. But as believers in Messiah, yes, as believers we should. We should oppose oppression. There's no doubt about it. And we should oppose exploitation wherever we see it. You know, women in many cultures throughout the world and in many religions have been suppressed and made to, to be like servants in their homes. They have been looked down on over the centuries and horrific things have been done to women throughout cultures and throughout religion. People have even used the Bible to try and to suppress and oppress women and say that they are second-class citizens. And this has honestly brought shame upon religion in general and upon Christianity and the Messianic faith today because we are not exempt from these abuses. So when we're looking at these abuses, we should really look back to Yeshua. How did Yeshua treat women? 
We see that everywhere that Yeshua went, he treated them with courtesy and with honor. And that was in an age and a time when women, women's voice was not respected. They were not allowed to testify in court. Their voice was not given any respect. And yet Yeshua showed courtesy and honor to them. Now let's get back to verses 1 through 2. And I'm going to read it from the complete Jewish Bible. It says, In this same way, wives submit to your husbands, so that even if some of them do not believe the word, they will be won over by your conduct, without saying anything, as they see your respectful and pure manner. So in this context of what Peter's actually talking about, it seems to be a divided home, where the wife is a believer and the husband is not. And I know that you probably know many people who are in this situation, and even in our congregation, who struggle with this, where one is a believer and the other is not. Now Peter gives instructions on how a believing wife will be able to win her husband without saying a word. Rather, by representing Yeshua in her life, in a godly life. Now, David Stern, in his commentary, he, he, he kind of takes a little poetic license. He says, don't become a nudge or a nudnik, which uh, is Yiddish for a nag or a bore. Because that's not going to win your spouse over. You know, our loved ones, our siblings, our, our parents, our, our children, they are honestly many times not willing to listen to what we say. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. They don't want really to hear what you say, but they absolutely will look at your life. They will watch you when you're in a difficult time. How do you react? Do you react like the rest of the world? Or are you in a place of peace? A place where we're not unsettled. No, no, rather, we know what Jesus said. He said these things would happen. No, we know that our trust is in Him, not in government, not in, not in even our freedom that we might have. No, we are submitted to Him. And our relationship with the Lord through our life is the most powerful testimony to our loved ones. And this is exactly what Peter's saying. He's saying, demonstrate the life of Yeshua in you, to your spouse. Let's go on to verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4, he says this, Your beauty should consist not in externals, such as fancy hairstyles, gold jewelry, or what you wear. Rather, let it be of inner character of your heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and a quiet spirit. In God's sight, this is of great value. Peter encourages wives to be respectful and pure, but also to avoid a preoccupation with appearance. You see, this draws unnecessary attention to external beauty and to oneself, rather than giving glory to the Lord. He's talking about not, not going over the top with fancy braiding of the hair and wearing of gold jewelry and putting on extravagant dresses. Now, Peter is not forbidding combing your hair. He's not forbidding braiding your hair, nor is he forbidding wearing of, of jewelry or wearing a nice dress every once in a while to go out to a black tie event. He's not saying that it's not allowed. What he is saying is that the outward appearance is not as important as the inward character of the heart. The inward qualities are far more important because the outward appearance is temporary. It's corruptible. We, we read this in, in, uh, in Proverbs 31 verse 10. It talks of the excellent wife, Ashet Chayil, the noble wife, who can find? Her value is far more precious than rubies. And when we read this proverb, we see a lot of internal qualities of an excellent wife. And I think that they do have particular relevance. So let's turn to Proverbs 31, verse 25. Proverbs 31, verse 25. 
Strength and dignity are her clothing. She laughs at the days to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. A lesson of kindness is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and bless her, her husband, and he praises her. Many daughters have excelled, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears Adonai will be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her deeds praise her in the gates. A woman's beauty comes from within. It comes from the love that she has for the Lord, and how she honors the Lord with her life. You know, we know also in the Proverbs it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, in, in my opinion, this does not give women license to simply let themselves go and to pay no attention to the way they look. I don't think that that's what Peter's trying to say at all. In fact, he then goes on in verse 5, 1 Peter, back to 1 Peter, verse 5 and 6, he says, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you have become her daughters by doing what is good, not fearing intimidation. Just as the holy women in the past, they put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. That's how, that's how David Stern translates this. Just the same way that Sarah obeyed Abraham, honoring him as her Lord. Now, Sarah was beautiful. In fact, we see several cases in Scripture where there were two different kings who tried to hit on Sarah and, and steal Sarah away from her husband. And what did he do? <laughs> he lied, said that she was his sister, and allowed them to do it. Okay, there's <laughs> I look at that and I'm like, what were you thinking, man? Why can't you stand up and say she's my wife over my dead body? I'm sure that's what he was afraid of, that it was going to be over his dead body. But that being said, she was beautiful. Sarah was beautiful. And yet even after Abraham had treated her like that, she still respected him and chose to respect him. Chose to give him honor by calling him Adoni, my Lord. Now, of course, Peter doesn't stop with the wife's role. He then goes on to the husband's role. Verse 7. In the same way, you husbands, likewise, conduct your married lives with understanding. Although your wife may be weaker physically, you should respect her as a fellow heir of the gift of life. If you don't, your prayers will be blocked. You husbands, likewise, or in the same way. Husbands, too, have a similar responsibility for love and respect. And I would add that when Paul talks about this in Ephesians 5, he talks of a mutual respect one to another. A mutual submission. Submit one to the other. Husbands are called to be the head of the home. And wives are called to submit to their husbands. But all of this must be done in this atmosphere of mutual submission. As unto the Lord. Just as we respect other authorities, the king, the rulers, the president, the prime minister, the police. So also the respect within the house is unto, as unto the Lord, in the same way that we respect the Lord. This is not a tall order. You know, instructions for husbands are very demanding. Uh, Rabbi Shaul actually commands husbands to love your wives as Messiah loved the congregation. Now, what did, how did Yeshua demonstrate his love to the congregation? By laying his life down. I've asked this question of many wives. I've asked, how easy would it be to submit to your husband if he was always willing to lay his life down for you? 
as Jesus laid his life down for the congregation. And every time the wives would be like, oh, that'd be easy. <laughs> My husband was actually laying his life down. Then that would make peace in the home a much greater reality. You know, this is the role of husbands. We're supposed to reflect the very nature of Yeshua. We're supposed to reflect his humility. We're supposed to reflect his laying down of his life for his wife and for his children. What does that look like? It means that instead of entertaining myself, I need to be looking out to the needs of my children. Instead of worrying about only what's going to satisfy me, I need to rather put my needs aside and say, no, I'm going to choose to put the needs and desires of my wife above me. I'm going to choose to put the needs of my children above me. We as husbands are called to die daily, just as Paul talks about. We are called to model our lives after Yeshua. Now that would transform our homes. If we as husbands, as fathers, would truly model our lives after the self-sacrifice that Yeshua demonstrated, that would change our society and our nation. But firstly, it would change the peace, the shalom within our homes. Peter says, husbands, conduct your married lives with understanding. The term married life does include the idea of the sexual relationship, but it's not limited to that. Honestly, husbands are encouraged to work hard at understanding their wives, understanding their moods, their feelings, their needs, their fears and their hopes. We need to listen to our wives with a heart, with our hearts, and demonstrate that love and bring joy to their lives. Verse 7 goes on and says, Although the wife might be weaker physically, you should respect her as a fellow heir of the gift of life, or else, or if you don't, your prayers will be blocked. Husbands must honor their wives as having equal value before God. Men and women are on an equal playing field when it comes to value. And although women are, I would believe, physically weaker, this by no means says that women are weaker either emotionally and or intellectually. On the contrary, it's the exact opposite in many cases. Or maybe you could say 50-50. But regardless, we are called to honor our wives as fellow heirs of the things that God has given. And you know that when Peter was talking to the wives, he just gave them recommendations. Not really a warning in there. However, when he talks to the husbands, he gives a very, very, very hard warning. If you don't, your prayers are going to be hindered. Have you wondered why your prayers may not be listened to? How are you treating your spouse? How are you treating your wife? husbands. I want to conclude with just two questions that we need to consider. Wives, are you submitting to your husbands? And is that submission to your husbands reflecting the glory of God? Is that demonstrating peace in the home, the way that you submit to your husbands, is that reflecting the glory of God in your lives? Husbands, are you loving your wife? Are you laying your life down for her? Are you truly putting her needs 
above your own. And is this laying down of your life reflecting the glory of God in your lives and in your families? It's a serious question. And um, I come back to, to this book that I've been reading through as a devotional by Bob Mumford, The Agape Road, Journey to Intimacy with the Father. One of the things that he challenged me with the most is, is the love that you're giving simply loving the person for them, to benefit them, with no desire whatsoever of getting anything out of it in return? And I would say that to the husbands. Is the love that you're demonstrating to your wife truly for them and for their betterment? And to the wives, is the love that you're giving to your husband reflecting that also? Abba Father, I preach this knowing full well that I fall short. And Lord, that I don't measure up to the things that you've called me to do. And so I'm asking Lord on my behalf to forgive me for the areas where I have not put my wife and my children above myself, where I have not laid my life down. I ask for your forgiveness. Father, forgive me. And Lord, I'm just praying as a congregation that you would forgive us in the ways that we have not demonstrated this peace in the home that you have called for. Lord, you have put the responsibility equally upon the husbands and on the wives for the peace that is in the home. And Lord, I ask for your mercy in every way that we have not reflected this. Please forgive us. Lord, bring forgiveness, I pray. In Yeshua's name. And we're going to close out the, uh, the live stream uh, with the Aharonic benediction. But then we're going to go and continue the Zoom and with the breaking of bread. And I would encourage all of all of you who aren't watching from the, the live Zoom, go get some juice and a cracker and really spend some time with the Lord and just say, Lord, I remember what you did for me. Yevarecha Adonai vayishmarecha Yahed Adonai p'navlecha v'chunecha Yisa Adonai p'navlecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.